Did anybody good morning. have a good Christmas this year in spite of 2020? It was good, wasn't it? I welcome you all here to the last Sunday of 2020. Thank God. I hope you all are here ready to come together and worship the Lord. Um, we have a few announcements. I'm sure you can anticipate what most of these are. Wednesday nights are still suspended. We have no activity on Wednesday nights. Although sometime into next year, uh, there will be more information about, uh, here it is, January 13th at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday night, Bob is going to start leading another class. Um, there will not be any meals served at this time like we used to do on Wednesday nights. Who knows, maybe down the road that might change, but for right now, eat before you show up. 7 o'clock p.m., January 13th. Um, we are have an upcoming uh, mission evangelism multiplication training event coming up in beginning January the 8th and going through the 10th. So that's Friday, at, Friday evening, Saturday, and then Sunday morning. It's going to be led by a gentleman by the name of Mark Bain, very highly respected. Um, he can teach us a lot. His picture's up on the mirror right now, so I want to look at him. Uh, he's a director of evangelism and new church development in the United States and Canada for the Church of the Nazarene. So he's not small potatoes. We will be having a continental breakfast and lunch provided for the, safter, uh, for the Saturday session. If you haven't already, please, please let Dad, Debbie know that you're going to attend so we can have the right amount of food on hand. It's kind of embarrassing when we have to run down to McDonald's. <laughs> let Debbie know if you plan to attend, especially on that Saturday. Is it that's just for Saturday or for any of the days? Just for Saturday. Just for Saturday. It's more of a count so we have a table set up yeah. for food prepared. You can tell her if you're going to come on Friday or Sunday too, but it's not going to affect any. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And as we just mentioned, Bob's going to be having a new lesson starting on Wednesday, the January 13th. Um, beginning Sunday, January 24th. Pastor Christie will be leading a greeters class at 9.30 during Sunday school. I assume that means 9.30 in the morning. I hope I got that right. It's actually just one-time meeting. Oh, okay. It's not a new class. Okay. It's just going to be a, a one-time See, she's already so starting to beg off. Me, okay. Cool. You're probably, probably right. I just got it right. Yeah. And it does say 9.30 during Sunday school, so that would be in the morning. If you come here at 9.30 at night, you're going to miss it. <laughs> if you want to be a greeter, you'll want to come and attend this class. Um, we encourage everybody to give here. We do not encourage people to give because we need money. We encourage people to give so that God can bless your giving. It is in your giving that God blesses us. It is in, God, in serving God that He blesses us. So give. If you choose to, you can give by texting the word GIVE to 915-206-2938. Excuse me. <laughs> Or you can use the Tithely app, or you can go on our website at swcnas.org and click on the Give button at the top of the page. Or really old school, you can put money in our little box over here, the black box sitting on the wall. We do check that from time to time. Please contact Debbie Jackson if you have any questions, if you need any assistance within each any of these options for giving. Um, do we have a scriptural reading that we're going to be doing? We do. If you can, if you would, please rise for the reading of God's Word. For all of all God's, God's promises, promises have, have been, been fulfilled, fulfilled in, in Christ, Christ with a with resounding, resounding yes. yes. And through Christ, our Amen, which means yes, ascends to God for His glory. It is God who enables us, along with you, to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us.
And he has identified us as by his own, own, by placing the by Holy placing Spirit the in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. It's Second Corinthians 1, 20 and 22. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do humbly come before you today. We're gracious. We're grateful for all that you do for us. We're grateful for all the love you provide to us. We're grateful you for your protection and for your provision. We ask that you would be with this body as we come together to worship you together. Be with our pastor as he brings his sermon a little bit later on. Guide and protect each one of us as we leave from this place and let us go out and be lights into this dark world on your behalf. All these things, Lord, we do ask in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. Remain standing and we'll sing for a little while. <laughs> We've got a... When we all get to heaven, this is one. You can clap your hands on this one. This is a hand-clapping song.
Day. 
chapter 2. It's going to be Matthew chapter 2 starting with verse 7. It'll be Matthew chapter 2 starting with verse 7. Does anyone have any praises or prayer requests before we dig it into the Word and pray? Yes, ma'am. Um, you don't know, but anyway, it's day Lord, and anyway, you know, you know he had cancer and
uh, us in this game with our life. What for? He created you and me so that we will be able with, to be with Him forever. He created you and me so that we can worship Him, we can walk, walk with Him. Because He invited us, He said, Come to me, all of you who are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who walks in the light will never walk in darkness. So that is what the most important thing in our life is to walk with Him. Light. And you know, as human beings, remember that we are not perfect. But God, we have a high priest in heaven who will hear us. Or we, you know, the, the scripture says if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us. We can come, come to Him always as His high priest in heaven. And He is interceding for us. And we thank God for Jesus Christ, you know, who came as a baby, as a Savior. Now He will be, He will be, he will be with Him forever as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, we just come before you today. We thank you for the praises, Lord. We thank you for, Lord, even though when we go through dark times, that you were always there. And you were always present, Father. And Lord, we just ask that you speak to us this morning and the word that you'd have. Open our hearts and minds to what you would want. And we say these things, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 2, starting with verse 7. It'll be Matthew chapter 2, starting with verse 7. It says, Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men. And he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me, so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem, and went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy, and they entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. So this is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Amen. So I want to take us all the way back to around 586 B.C. And this is long before Jesus was born. And this is a time where the Babylonians, the, the mighty superpower of the day, they had overwhelmed the city of Jerusalem. And this put an end to the kingdom of God on earth for a time as the temple was destroyed. The Jewish, you know, if you, if you notice that heaven and earth was, was the temple. This is where heaven and earth met and that was in the temple. And this, is, this ended the, the heaven on earth period of time from their standpoint. And so Nebuchadnezzar came and he did what most con conquerors did of his day, is he demolished the city, he destroyed the wall, he destroyed the temple, and he looted the palaces, and, and he tortured those who resisted them. And so then what he does is he sets up this new government. And unlike other mighty kingdoms, Babylonian did something different. They carefully selected the most promising students as well as other people could benefit them from their conquered nations and they relocated them to their capital. And so for the best and brightest, the Babylonian king would bring them into his palace for a special schooling. And this, would, this schooling would last a few years. And so they would gather knowledge from astronomy and astrology and sciences and, and metaphysics and some philosophies and, and religions, not only to assimilate them into the Babylonian way but of thinking, but to advise their new king and, be, and support their new government. And one of these best and brightest from recently conquered Judah was a young man named Daniel. And who was outshined everyone. And so after several encounters with the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, he became one of the favored wise men and trusted advisors to the king. Amen. 
And so in the Babylonian government, Daniel became this powerful prophet. He predicted the rise and fall of four major empires of the world with astounding accuracy. As a matter of fact, he was so accurate in his, in his prophecy that some people believe that they were clever forgeries later, you know, written down in, in history that people would just forge it. However, people need to realize that true prophets of the Lord, true prophets of the Lord are never wrong. <laughs> So amongst his predictions, Daniel wrote about the fall of Babylon and then the rise of the Persian Empire and would, would and, and overtake them and the Persian king would then let the Israelites as well as all conquered people, you know, you know, return back home. And the Persians would allow the, the temple and eventually the wall of Jerusalem to be rebuilt. And so taking Daniel's writing in considerations, those living around 483 Jewish lunar years after this event, after the wall had been built, any serious student of the Hebrew scriptures would have been looking for the Messiah to appear. And it was during this time that, you know, people's hearts were stirred and they're like, you know what, something's, something's going on. God is going to be doing something. We, we've talked about the, the birth of Christ had come and they knew something was, was on the horizon here. And, and, and so, and so, you know, you know um, the school of wise men that we, we see in, in, in Matthew chapter 2, we, the Magi are wise men. And we know them as three. There probably could have been a lot more. There could have been a lot more than just three, but, you know, traditionally we just think of three. But these school of wise men, uh, of which Daniel was, was part of, took great care in charting the, the heavens and, and charting the movement of things. And so that we see in the scripture that Matthew records this group of wise men, these magi from the east who arrived in Jerusalem. And so being wise men from the east meant that they most likely were remnants of the old Babylonian empire and Persian schools of wise men. This is why we went through all this, was they were remnants from this, these, these ages past. And so as these men were astrologers and they're well into how things went, they noticed the positions of certain stars and planet during the time of Jesus' birth and, notices, and they noticed his star and they knew what this meant. This was not by accident that these wise men had taken this trip. It wasn't by accident that they were there. They knew exactly what they were doing. These men were not guessing. And so after seeing this, and they, and they read the signs, and they knew what was going on, and, and these men went on this journey to find a great king. And the journey of the wise men took them to Jerusalem. Well, why not? And this was the capital. When one would think of the birth of a king, you would go to the capital city to visit the king. And so they were no doubt expecting to enter a city and in the midst of this great celebration. Naturally entering Jerusalem, and they were asking, well, where is the newborn king of the Jews born? You know, that would make perfect sense. Where is he? We want to go celebrate with you. We've seen the signs. Now, one person didn't take this news of the wise men very good. That was Herod. <laughs> and what little we, what we know about him, this, this is a brutal man. And he was going to keep his power, he was going to keep his authority. And this, you know, no king was going to be born to take his throne. <laughs> okay, this wasn't going to happen with this man. So it piqued his interest, and you know, if we read earlier in, in the scriptures that he, he, he called the scribes and stuff, and he says, hey, wait a minute here. People are buzzing around these men who are coming in from the east, and they're looking for the king of the Jews. Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? They said, well, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. So he calls these, these wise men here, and he, and, and, he, and he starts talking to them, and he, and, 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 and he learns that, you know, probably learning when the star first appeared, and, and, and Herod was putting two and two together, and, and he was thinking, maybe this moment had come. 
And so with the wise men understanding, they, they were going to go to Bethlehem. And, and then Herod says, you know, I really want to worship this one too. So when you find him, can you tell me where he's at? You know, because I, I want to know. And we see that God intervenes and they didn't come back, right? But Because God knew his heart. So, so they look there, and they look towards Bethlehem, and they see in the stars, and it confirmed exactly where they were supposed to go. And it led them there. Not only did it lead them there, it led them to the right exact place where the child was. So they, they were filled with joy, and they came to their king, and... They entered the home where Mary was and, and Joseph were at, and they worshipped the Jesus. And these men for, who, whose, whose, whose traditions came from ancient Babylon, that at one point in history captured Jerusalem, bring it into exile, had now traveled to the land to see the king of kings. Give them gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And upon leaving to return their home and to go back to their old, old countries, we just said, God said, don't go there. Go another route. You don't want to go around that man. It's interesting about these wise men. Because if you really look at them, these were men who are paying attention. See, God's people knew in their hearts that the time had come for the Messiah to be born. They knew that this was going to be happening. And, and they all knew God was going to move into a new era. And, and few participated in it, though. Few understood exactly what was going to happen. And God only let a, a few people to be part of that. And only a few participated in that. Because not only did these wise men, wise men understand that the time had come, they didn't just look and say, well, the time has come, and then they went about their day. They just looked and they said, hey, look, something special, the time has come, and they acted upon that. And they took this long journey to Bethlehem to see the newborn king. They saw the signs of the times, and they acted accordingly. We don't read in Scripture that God promised them that they would find Jesus. God didn't, like, literally visit them. God never promised them a particular outcome. They just saw the signs of the times and acted accordingly and sought the newborn king. And went to seek Jesus, and they found him. When everyone was out and about, moving about their daily lives, God was moving. And the challenge for us is, are we going to understand what God is up to? Understanding that, and, or as we understand what, that God is up to something, or, or, are we going to stay on the sidelines to maybe see what God is going to do? Sometimes we like to be in the crowd, and sometimes, you know, when, when you're standing in a crowd rooting for your favorite team, you know, you have a few things to say about them. <laughs> you can be critical. I'm a Chiefs fan. I don't need to be critical because we always win, but, you know, some of you other people don't. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> But a lot of times we're like, hey, I want God to move, and, I, and I'm excited for God to move, that we, we, we just sit on the sidelines and wait for something to happen. But others understand the signs. Others understand that God is moving within, within our midst, and we want to participate in what God is doing, and we want to see him in the process. We want to be, we want to be a part of that. And we're challenged to pay attention to what God is doing amongst us and participate in what he is up to. And it's not about feeling if we're up to do it or not. It's about letting our hearts and minds open to the things that the Spirit is telling us. And I, I'm sure there are many times during the trip of the wise men that they question, what in the world are we doing? This is crazy. This trip has taken us so long. 
but they did it anyway because they knew something was up and they paid attention. They paid attention to what God was up to. Not on their own personal opinions of how God should work, because if you do, you're going to miss him. He's not going to, because a lot of times when we have in our mind, this is how God is supposed to work, he's going to tell you, he's, he's going to show you that he's God, he's going to work in a different way. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've had my plans laid out and they've been disrupted. Be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit within our lives. To be open to the fact that God might adjust our lives for His purpose. He might position us in uncomfortable situations. He might take things out of our lives. He might put other things within our lives. But God is going to be up to something. He might give us warnings, you know, to not go someplace, even though we might not have all the reasons why. Or He might call us to do something else that doesn't make sense. But all we need to know is that we're, we're, we're doing it because the Christ has called us. And then we allow him to maneuver us for his purpose to participate in his work and he might take things and add things and throughout this process and things will be a little bit chaotic and the world is going to respond and it with, with, with its misunderstanding but we're going to see Jesus. You might have people on the sidelines, in and out of the church, being nice and comfy as we're moving forward or going about their daily lives. But you're going to see Jesus. I want to leave us with this. The simple birth of Jesus, God becoming man, born in the condition of humanity, to live as we live, it gives us hope. It's a secure future. For many of us, it, it's been a difficult year. You know? There's, there's people that, if this virus didn't happen, that we might, they might be alive today. We've lost loved ones. We've had good times happen. We've had bad times happen. We've, we've lived in a lot of anxiety. Or Some of us are, are stubborn enough to not really worry about that. <laughs> we just go about our day anyway. But things are different. While others have adapted well concerning the circumstances, some of us just want to pull our covers over our head and we want a redo of the day, we want a redo of the month, or maybe a redo of the year, or life all, you know, all together. It's, it's easy to sink into this escapism, to try to hide, to, to hide away, to keep oneself safe as possible from the hardships of the world. That the incarnation, God becoming man, is not one of escapism. The messenger of a God who enters into the suffering with us. And God left the glory of heaven and entered into a time of suffering amongst the people who are well acquainted with grief and sorrow. God who chose to enter the suffering with his people in order that they may not suffer alone. Amen. Amen. Because God is present with us. And he invites us on this journey. He has already entered in these areas with us. He's already there. He says, look, you don't have to do this alone. I'm going to walk with you. And guess what? I want you to participate. And you're going to, you're going to see me. I'm not hidden. I don't play hide and seek with you. <laughs> you know, sometimes we think he does, but he just doesn't. He's going to walk with us and we're going to participate in his work because he is our redeemer. He's going to redeem us from everything. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, you know, Lord, as a lot of the world was going about their daily lives, and even though there was excitement within the air that, you know, and their hearts were restless that you were doing something and, and you were doing something. 
But the people who participated within this weren't the mighty kings. They weren't the religious elites. They were the more simple people. There were people that, that one would never think well, that would be part of the birth of Christ. The birth of the Messiah. But Father, there were, there were these, these wise men are a great reminder, Lord, that they, they saw the signs of the times and they acted appropriately and they saw what they needed to see. And even though there were those on the sidelines with misunderstandings and, 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 and the hearts of, you know, hardened hearts and wanted to keep power, Lord, you maneuvered your people accordingly. Yeah. And your will was done. Father, I, I thank you that you've given us no excuse to, to not participate, Lord, that you've given us no excuse to say I'm not good enough when you've called the very simple, you've called us that we are good enough. We're good enough for you to work within our lives. We're good enough to participate in your work. We're good enough to be your people, redeemed by a Savior. Father, we need you. We need you to guide us. We need you to heal us. We need you to speak within our hurts and our pains and our confusions sometimes. But Father, we thank you there and you're, you're not afraid to go anywhere. Even the deepest, deepest, darkest places of our lives. And Father, as we end this year and, and go to the next, we know you're already there. And we thank you for that, Lord. We say these things. You say we pray. Amen. Good day, amen. Could you please stand for the blessing? May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen and amen. You are dismissed.